good morning. My name is Elizabeth Anderson, and I am the director of the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here this morning to ABA Rowley's annual conference on contemporary rule of law issues. This is a moment that we take each spring to pause in what is sometimes a frenetic activity of implementing rule of law development programs around the world, including the program you may have seen uh, featured in this video uh, supporting uh, the Bar Associations of Turkey to provide legal information and uh, access to legal counsel to Syrian refugees in, in Turkey. Um, just one of, of dozens of programs that we implement in over 50 countries. But today at our annual conference, we pause in that work to reflect on what we are learning in that rule of law development uh, effort, uh, to bring together smart people who can help us learn, and uh, together to strengthen the rule of law development movement. Uh, our theme this year, of course, is when people flee, forced migration and the rule of law. And our goal is to look at this topic that is very much in the news and on policymakers' minds through a rule of law lens. Now, you know, there's a saying that uh, where you stand is where you sit, and we all at ABA Rowley, of course, sit in an organization called the Rule of Law Initiative. So um, we may be a little bit biased, but even accounting for that bias, it seems pretty clear that the migration crisis is very much a rule of law problem, and that rule of law issues are at the heart of this challenge that we face globally as drivers of migration in the first place and as serious obstacles to uh, uh, sustainable solutions for migrants the world over. And so that's what today is all about, and we're delighted that all of you can be here to help us think hard about this very pressing challenge. Let me say a few words of welcome and then invite our co-hosts uh, also to welcome you, um, and, and words of thanks. Um, this is, of course, a, a collective effort. Um, to stage for this work, we commissioned a paper on the topic in ABA Rowley's paper series, and you may have picked it up uh, at the registration. I want to commend the co-authors Paulina Rudnicka of ABA Rowley's Research, Evaluation, and Learning Division. Paulina, I, I think, is here somewhere to get in the back. Um, should get uh, great credit for that effort, which she um, took on together with uh, Beth Ferris of Georgetown University. Is Beth here as well? Oh, there she is. Wonderful. So, uh, oh, that, that red line is uh, our nemesis. Um, but, but kudos to Paulina and to Beth. This is really a masterful effort, condensing a very complex topic in a readable uh, survey of both the legal frameworks and, uh, and also uh, very concrete suggestions for policy and legal interventions that can make a difference. Second, I'd like to recognize Dr. Linda Bishai, ABA Rowley, Director of Research Evaluation and Learning. And uh, stand up, Linda, so everyone can see you. Uh, Linda has really led this effort from beginning to end. And uh, it's been a, a, a huge uh, labor of love. That labor will not end today. Uh, in fact, we'll carry on tomorrow as Linda convenes an expert working group to uh, look at the rapporteur notes from our discussions today and glean from them key recommendations and develop a conference report. And that is as important a part of this effort as, as today is. And if I could maybe ask our members of our expert working group to stand um, to be recognized. So thank you in advance for the work that you all will do. And these are the people to buttonhole during the coffee break so that you can get your recommendations into the conference report, which we will then feed into the development of ABA policy by the ABA House of Delegates and also into the UN Global Compact process. Um, third, I'd like to recognize the ABA Rowley Board of Directors, led by our chair, Judge Margaret McEwen, whom you'll hear from in a, mo in a moment, and its program committee, led by uh, Judge James Wynn. And so if I could invite the board uh, members here to stand and be recognized. 
Their, their insights, advice, and contacts were invaluable as we put together today's uh, program. We're also very honored to have with us ABA President Hillary Bass and ABA President-elect Bob Carlson. Uh, maybe Hillary isn't here yet, but I know Bob is, and uh, they will be here throughout the day. B Bob? <laughs> This, it's really quite extraordinary to uh, have the two leaders of the ABA here with us, and it really uh, evidences the importance that the ABA puts on this topic and our gathering today. Uh, let me also say a big thanks to the dozens of ABA Roley staff and interns and volunteers who've helped us uh, uh, pull this off. And finally, thank you to our co-sponsors, other ABA entities that are listed in your program, and especially uh, the Commission on Immigration and its director, Meredith Linsky, who's a member of our expert working group and with us as well. And finally, certainly not uh, least, for this beautiful venue and the collaboration, we're very pleased uh, to be working with George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. And with that, let me invite its uh, associate dean, Jennifer Brinkerhoff, to welcome you as well. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, uh, ABI Roley, for all your hard work here. Distinguished guests, good morning. My name is Jennifer Brinkerhoff. I am the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Research Initiatives here at the Elliott School, and also a Professor of Public Administration and International Affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today to the ABA Roley 2018 Conference on Contemporary Rule of Law Issues, and to the Elliott School of International Affairs. The Elliott School is proud to co-sponsor this important event, which will examine when people flee rule of law and forced migration, as Elizabeth already outlined. We're especially grateful to be working with such great partners in the American Bar Association's Rule of Law Initiative. I'd also like to take a moment to extend special thanks to Elizabeth Anderson, Linda Bashai, who also happens to be on our faculty, and um, Lindsay Raynor and Hannah Hosner Hosnerova, I hope I pronounced that correctly, of AVA Roley. It is your vision, dedication, and collaborative partnership with the Elliott School's Tova Norlin, our Assistant Dean for Research, and Kelly Smith of our Public Affairs that made this event a reality. Thank you all for your hard work. From my perspective, the Elliott School ABA Roley Academic Partnership Collaboration, pr Practitioner Collaboration, is an ideal partnership. At the Elliott School, we're here to build world leaders, leaders with the skills and ethical underpinnings to create a more peaceful future. Few organizations better embody such leadership than ABA Roley. In over 100 countries and for over 25 years, ABI has endeavored to promote justice, economic opportunity, and human dignity through the rule of law. It is truly an honor to host this event with you and as we convene to analyze one of today's toughest global challenges, the refugee and migration crisis. Our collaboration in this area has enriched the Elliott School's work on this topic, and I am confident that today's event will only further our understanding of rule in law and forced migration. On a personal note, I began my career as a practitioner of international development, and I had the privilege of working on the Civil Society Program Design Team when USAID was standing up the then new Center for Democracy and Governance in 1994. I'm old. <laughs> I've long been familiar with ABA Roley, in other words, and the important work that it does to support the rule of law around the world. I've subsequently dedicated much of my academic career to studying the potential of diasporas to contrib contribute to peace and development in their countries of origin. I participated in several of the Civil Society Days of the Global Forums on Migration and Development, and most recently I was a speaker at the Global Forum on Remittances and Development in New York, where I had the opportunity to see in action Louise Arbor, United Nations Special Representative for International Migration, from whom we'll hear later on today. I'm therefore particularly appreciative that we have the opportunity to spotlight these issues of governance and migration here today. If only it were possible to create the governance foundations that would prevent people from wanting to leave in the first place. 
I'm confident that today's deliberations will contribute to making that vision a reality. As the Elliott School prepares its students to tackle the world's toughest problems, we emphasize collaborative and interdisciplinary solutions. The migration crisis, perhaps more than most global challenges, demands such an approach. With rates of displacement at their highest level since World War II, and with displacements becoming increasingly prolonged, in, um, innovative, integrative, and sustainable solutions are needed to ensure the safety and dignity of displaced persons throughout the world. Rule of law efforts will be key components of any real solution, and an examination of the relationship between rule of law and forced migration will go a long way toward identifying what needs to be done. To that end, we have a great conference in store for you today. We're pleased to welcome a diverse group of stakeholders in the refugee and migration policy arenas, and we're proud to count Elliott School professors Key Lu and Dr. Harris Malonis among today's featured experts. After opening remarks, we look forward to our breakout sessions where we'll analyze challenges facing migrants in their countries of origin, transit, and destination. Case studies from Syria, Central America, and Africa prom promise to discern the effects of rule of law issues on migrants and should ultimately offer exceptional insight on the way forward for the global community. In addition, we have the privilege of several world-class keynote speakers. In a moment, we'll hear from former Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration, Anne C. Richard. And later this afternoon, both Hilary Bass, the president of the American Bar Association, and Louise Arbor, the United Nations Special Representative for International Migration, as I mentioned, will offer remarks to close our proceedings. Finally, I want to thank you, the audience, for attending today, and I hope you are as excited as I am about this rich agenda and the discussion that will follow. And now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Judge Margaret McCohen. In addition to her position on the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge McCohen also chairs the ABA Rowley Board. Judge McCohen, thank you very much for being here today. Good morning. On behalf of the ABA Rule of Law Initiative Board of Directors, let me also join in welcoming you and thanking you for being here. I think we'll have a very important dialogue today. One of the real strengths of the ABA is our convening power, and that's exactly what we're doing here today. It's our ability to bring together a diverse group of stakeholders to try to take a deep dive into a better understanding of legal problems. We do this every day in the United States, but it's also a very critical element of what we do around the world with our rule of law programs. We work closely with local partners, with our funders, local NGOs, in putting together not only law ongoing and sustainable programs, but doing research and development in over 45 countries. So we're playing that convening role here again today, bringing all of you together. And if you'll look around and as you meet during the breaks and in your breakout sessions, you'll see that we have a very big diversity of attendees. We have individuals from humanitarian organizations, from development organizations, lawyers, non-lawyers, donors, implementers, academics, practitioners, those from our country and for beyond. And also we have all of us hailing some from refugee producing countries, others from transit countries, and others from destination countries. As our dean indicated, I sit on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We have the largest immigration docket of any circuit court in the United States. But one of the very happy events that we do is when we're able to preside over naturalization ceremonies. So tonight, as soon as the conference finishes, I will jump on the plane and fly to California and tomorrow preside over the swearing-in ceremony of several thousand new American citizens. 
And I can't tell you the thrill, there's over a hundred and some countries represented each time. And as we yell out, Mexico, and everybody stands up and waves their flags, you know, Burundi, Somalia, the Philippines, China, it, it is really thrilling for me and it's very exciting. So in some ways it's really the embodiment of what we're talking about here today. We have a lot to learn from each other and I thank you all in advance for coming and for your contribution. To start us off, uh, we're very privileged to have an expert in the field, Anne C. Richard. She is a long-serving public servant and dedicated to many development and international activities. She's held senior positions in the government and in uh, NGOs, including the Peace Corps, International Rescue Committee, and the Office of Management and Budget. But most recently, and very pertinent to what we're talking about, she recently served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration. If you look at her CV, she's the author of numerous books and many articles, but she's now engaged in both teaching and research as a professor at Georgetown. She's associated with Georgetown's Institute of Study of International Migration. So we're delighted to have you this morning, Professor Richard, wherever you are. Oh, there you are. Um, and your insights into this really important topic. So on behalf of the ABA, thank you and welcome. Thank you, uh, Margaret, for that very nice introduction um, and for reminding us all of um, you know, the importance of offering a home to new citizens. It's a really, it's a fantastic part of the American experience. And if you haven't been to a naturalization ceremony, I, I encourage you to go. Um, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to kick things off today, especially Elizabeth Anderson, Linda Bishai, and Lindsay Rayner. I'm happy to be back at George Washington University, you just heard I work at another university, but I'm happy <laughs> to be uh, back at GW where Dean Ruben Brigitte, my, my longtime friend, is the dean, and Professor Michael Barnett is here, who's a real expert on these things. If you have any questions about anything I say today, just direct those questions to Michael Barnett. <laughs> and also Key Lu, another longtime friend, um, an expert, a true expert in disaster response and, 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 and a former <laughs> refugee uh, from Vietnam, a real, a real national asset. We, I don't know if we declare people national treasures, but <laughs> I might nominate you, Key Lu, uh, for that. It's great to see you. So it's um, both an honor and a pleasure to address this annual conference of the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative an initiative that has done so much good over the years in so many countries, and I applaud you all for dedicating your discussions today to the nexus of rule of law and forced migration. Your timing, your timing on this is excellent. So over the past few years, the number of people forcibly displaced around the world has unfortunately climbed. Today, hundreds of millions of people are on the move. Um, some of them are on the move for positive reasons, right? Business, schooling, to connect with relatives, to explore, and for tourism. Within that overall number, there are, however, 65 million people who have been uprooted by persecution and conflict. 22 million have crossed a border and become refugees, and they look to us for help. More than 40 million are still inside and in some cases trapped inside their home countries. These are the internally displaced persons, or IDPs, who deserve help from their own governments, but may be underserved, or in some situations, like Syria, attacked by their own governments. And I say that today as chemical weapons inspectors are trying to get into Duma. So if you've been following the news and paying attention, we have sort of the worst examples of uh, mistreatment by a government of its own citizens. And then there are an estimated 240 million migrants on the move around the, the world, some of whom choose to leave their homes in search of a better life, and some who find their only way to survive is to set out for another place. 
Now, most of you will recall the events of 2015 when large numbers of refugees and migrants sought to reach Europe by boat and then trekked overland to reach Austria, Germany, and Sweden. The photograph of toddler Alan Kurdi's body washed up on the beach in Turkey. And, and what really got me, as it got many other people, were the little shoes he was wearing <laughs> that reminded so many of us of our own children's shoes. Um, that photo was published and viewed all over the world. At that time, there were vociferous demands to do more to help refugees. At the same time, others cautioned that the refugees could include terrorists in their mists. Certainly after the Paris attacks of November 13, 2015, bloody attacks largely planned and carried out by Europeans, there was a great deal of misinformation suggesting refugees were responsible for attacks, that they were dangerous and headed this way. These twin themes, on the one hand, that refugees and migrants should be helped, and on the other, that refugee and migrants are security or economic threat and need to be kept out of our countries, are hallmarks of international discussions on these topics, as well as competing themes here at home in our national policy debates. In my remarks today, I want to highlight the importance of global commitment and attention to the issues facing refugees, IDPs, and migrants. And let's start by going back to September 2016. One year after Alan Kurdi and his brother and his mother drowned, because in the intervening months, world leaders had decided to hold two high-level meetings in New York to consider ways to do more to help refugees and migrants. The first meeting was the high-level plenary on addressing large movements of refugees and migrants organized by the United Nations on September 19, 2016, open to all UN member states. This meeting, which was addressed by Secretary of State Kerry in addition to many other world leaders, led to the adoption by acclamation of the New York Declaration. As you can read in the issue paper, prepared for this conference by Paula Rudnicka and my, my, my dear friend, Elizabeth Ferris, who teaches at that other university. Um, um, this declaration was negotiated by diplomats in New York and reaffirmed core principles of migrants' rights and refugee protection. 193 countries agreed to better protect refugees and migrants and to do more to support affected states and communities. The New York Declaration also set in motion two processes that are underway right now. One is a compact on refugees led by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva. The other is a compact on migration. Compact is a term for agreements that are not treaties and as such non-binding. Yet these will be important vehicles for ideas and practices that can help us frame and inform the global response. UNHCR's Refugee Compact is promoting different ways or modalities to share responsibilities for helping refugees. And the timeline for this process is unfolding as we speak. Meetings happen monthly in Geneva, and the compact will be proposed in the High Commissioner's annual report to the General Assembly in August for consideration by them later in this year. I would just like to say normally I don't use quite so many technical terms in talking to a public audience. However, I know I am talking to members of the American Bar Association. <laughs> and I realize I'm talking to those of you in the first class section here who are dressed better and look very sharp today, as well as those of you in the back who are here for the continuing education credits or something you have to get as lawyers. Um, so all of you, I know, uh, are, are interested and can handle this level of uh, a technicality. So um, ideas uh, included in the Refugee Compact include regularly holding global refugee summits and also arrangements to support the governments of countries that host refugees um, involving uh, different stakeholders, engaging both humanitarians and development experts. Refugees International has stated, a voluntary and non-binding compact is unlikely to create new political will. But the right balance of government leadership, 
combined with UNHCR support, can harness existing political and diplomatic influence. The second compact is a global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. The process to develop this global compact for migration started in April 2017. It's a little different than the one for the refugees. Um, the General Assembly is planning to hold an intergovernmental conference on international migration in 2018 with a view to adopting the global compact. This, too, is a significant opportunity to improve the governance of migration and to address the challenges associated with today's migration. You will have the opportunity to hear more about this later today from Louise Arbor, the special representative of the Secretary General for International Migration. And I am hopeful that this compact could go a ways to recognize the contributions migrants make to sustainable development and the global economy, migrant, I believe, should not be a dirty word. One unfortunate aspect of having these two compacts, as flagged by the authors of the issue paper prepared for this conference, is that this approach reinforces the binary division between refugees and migrants. It does not look at their needs in a holistic way, and it also gives short shrift to the more than 40 million internally displaced persons who make up most of the forcibly displaced in need of help today. Despite these drawbacks, still, we have before us an historic global opportunity. The entire world is paying attention to these issues and processes are in motion to do something about them. Now, let's go back again to autumn 2016. The second important meeting held the day after the first on September 20th in New York at the United Nations was the Leaders Summit. It was an effort to engage more governments as donors and as hosts for refugees. And there was also a meeting with business leaders that also took place today. This was a White House initiative organized uh, under the name of President Obama. He was personally involved, and it was modeled on a peacekeeping summit held the year before. The peacekeeping summit was designed to raise contributions of money, troops, and equipment, and it was deemed a success by President Obama. So the Leaders' Summit also had three baskets, and the first two were for wealthy countries, that they give significant levels of humanitarian aid, and they resettle more refugees. And the third basket was oriented uh, to the countries hosting refugees, asking them to do more to allow refugees to work and their children to go to school. For many poor and middle-income countries, of course, these commitments would be contingent on the donor countries doing more to help them expand their educational systems and asking those wealthier countries to invest in the job-producing sectors of their economies. But it also had another feature that was built into the Leader Summit. Uh, countries had to earn their ticket to attend by indicating in advance that they would be announcing significant new contributions. It wasn't, it wasn't like the day before when everyone, all 193, were invited. This one, you had to earn your invitation. You had to show, you weren't allowed to show up until you committed to, to, to make a significant contribution. So 49 countries and several international organizations made commitments that day. The next step, of course, was following through on the commitments. The logical people to help the UN monitor and encourage follow through would have been the people in the White House. However, something else happened in the fall of 2016. I don't want to shock anyone here, but there was an American presidential election and it brought uh, President Donald Trump to power. So in 2016, um, candidate Trump was already an outspoken critic of the US refugee program and he really went into overdrive when he became president. And I, I was talking to a, a, a few of you yesterday about this and people said afterwards, as I went through this list, I started to get more and more agitated. So I'm taking a big, calm breath. 
the rabbi of Georgetown University told me, after that list, I thought I should go up and give you a hug. So listen, I don't need a hug, okay? But, but, but it's nice that she felt that way. And if any of you need a hug after this, just hug each other, okay? Um, but just, you know, handle it, all right? Um, so here's the list. First, seven days into the new administration, uh, President Trump's White House issued an executive order, which was the travel ban, and the first of three travel bans that have been fought in the courts, but the whole idea behind them that I have argued along with other national security folks was to stop the flow of Muslims to the United States. Um, and so these are being uh, duked out in the courts, um, but they've already had an impact on the pipeline of refugees coming to the United States. There has been a sharp decrease in the number of refugees resettled from 85,000 in fiscal year 2016 to 53,000 in the president's first year in office, and now we'll be lucky to reach 24,000 at uh, the current rate. This includes far fewer Syrians coming, uh, continued hostility to Muslim refugee populations, and also we're seeing fewer special immigrant visas, which is a different program, issued to those who helped uh, US forces and government officials uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And some of these SIVs, special immigrant visa recipients, uh, get to opt into being treated as refugees when they arrive in the US. What we see is the network across the United States of resettlement offices that are run by non-governmental organizations, some faith-based organizations, is imploding as they are sort of contracting as the numbers drop down. But there are also other measures that the administration has been taking that really collectively, I think, harm refugee around the world. First is, on the first day of taking office, the administration cut funding for the UN Population Fund that does so much around the world to help respond to women's reproductive needs and help families remain healthy. And I think this is a real shame, especially as I worked very closely with UN Population Fund and the administration to beef up their emergency response capabilities. Um, the administration has slashed funding for UNRWA, which has the responsibility for the five million Palestinians, dependent on it for education, um, job skills training, and health services in the Middle East. And, uh, I can't see how cutting services to this population really helps the situation in the Middle East right now. Uh, the administration has suggested budget cuts for lots of development programs that are important for fostering growth and preserving peace and stability. Unfortunately, Congress has not bought into this and has largely funded these programs. <clears throat> um, and relevant to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, the administration has refused to participate in deliberations on the Migration Compact, claiming this would undermine U.S. sovereignty, which is baloney. They put forward a candidate to head the International Organization for Migration, who has a record of tweeting anti-Muslim sentiments, which ought to disqualify him, despite his other, um, otherwise uh, solid record on as an aid worker. And there's also a lot of talk of dismantling the bureau I used to head at the State Department, and no assistant secretary has been uh, nominated to head that bureau. So <clears throat> let's take a moment, look at the list of good moves on the part of the Trump administration. It's very short. Um, they've kept the deal with Australia to accept refugees who were isolated in Manus Island in Nauru, even though the president thought it was the worst deal ever. Dumb. That's in addition. He thought it was a worse deal in addition to the Paris Climate Agreement and the Iran Nuclear Agreement, but, it, but he did say it was the worst deal ever. Um, they've kept using a protection transfer arrangement we set up in Costa Rica to keep refugees who are in imminent peril safe until they can be resettled, and they support the regional framework to help refugees being developed by six Latin American countries. By all accounts, Trump nominees to head UNICEF and the World Food Program are capable and experienced people doing good jobs. Unfortunately, the negatives vastly outweigh the positives. In some, the US is not setting a good example for the rest of the world, and instead is building walls to keep people out. I apologize for such a pessimistic report, but as concerned citizens and activists, you should know these things. 
You already know that the only way for refugees to truly go home in peace and safety is if the crises in their home countries are resolved and stability returns. Just laws, good governance, accountability, and access to justice. These are demanded by people all around the world and need to be developed in or returned to countries that are on the road to recovery from war or economic collapse. The lack of them is often at the root of unrest and conflict. You all have a very important role to play, and this conference is the moment to do it. Thank you for coming today, for recommitting yourselves to do what you can to help refugees, IDPs, and migrants, and for finding ways to make a contribution during these turbulent times. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one or two questions and then we'll move on to the next panel. Anyone? Okay. Well, yes. First of all, thank you so much for this interview. It's incredibly helpful. Thank um, you for nodding throughout. It really is helpful oh, to have okay. someone like you in the front row. You are my favorite audience member. I take back what I said about Kilo. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think the key person to ask is Louise Arbor, who's, who's, who's wrestling with that right now. But there, there, you know, what I think is interesting is look at the differences between the Compact for Refugees, which is sort of really owned by the High Commissioner for Refugees, that is taking place in Geneva, where there's a lot of experts on humanitarian issues, that has a very well thought through um, framework related to it, that, that UNHCR is really driving this process. On the other hand, the Compact for Migration seems to be a lot more sensitive. Uh, it's not just that the Trump administration has pulled out of it. It's also that it takes place in New York, where we found that discussions on these issues can be much more politicized. Um, the International Organization for Migration plays a role, but not necessarily the driving role the way UNHCR does. We worked hard to get IOM into the UN family of um, agencies in the um, Obama administration. And I think that was a good thing to do, and it was a departure from previous U.S. Um, uh, policy. Uh, and so I think, you know, some of this is going to set the tone, set a, a path for how migration issues are handled in the future. And um, that seems, it seems to be the much tougher um, uh, piece of this, and and you're lucky, I think, to to be able to hear Louise Arbor talk about it later today. Plus, she's a Canadian. You know, they seem to be doing a lot of things right lately. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Neha Mishra from the Solidarity Center, and I'm actually participating in some of the global compact negotiations on the migration one. And I'm a little curious just to hear your thoughts. One of the things that's been a little frightening to me during the negotiation process on the migration compact, not the refugee one, is what you mentioned at the beginning, the lack of complementarity between the two. Mm -hmm. And in the negotiations last uh, two weeks ago, whenever it was, um, there are a lot of discussions from governments, uh, you know, the EU, Russia and China, we expected, but the EU, Australia, others, governments really saying that we don't want to even mention the word refugees in the migration compact, even mm. though there's um, complementarity there. They don't even want to talk about irregular migration or mi irregular migrants. There were all these discussions that should only apply to regular migrants, et cetera. So I'm a little, uh, and then the US pulled out of, um, you know, the negotiation of this compact. And so, it, it, it's been really interesting to me. A lot of the commitments that are already there under human rights um, instruments, ILO instruments, they're actually pulling back and, and uh, trying not to reinforce those commitments. And so I'm a little curious about what you think about what are some other opportunities maybe outside of this compact process to bring us back to a human rights agenda, normative framework, um, because we're not hearing that at all in these negotiations. Yeah, that's a shame. And I'm glad you spoke up. Uh, to talk about this this morning. 
I think Americans have a special responsibility to try to diffuse uh, this image of migrants as somehow uh, bad people or failed people. Uh, when, we, when so many of us are descended from immigrants and refugees um, and, and people who, who were not necessarily the cream of the crop, I don't know about your family, but my family, <laughs> you know. <laughs> If we were doing well, we would have stayed in Ireland and Germany. Um, so, so, so clearly there's something about the American experience that ought to be demonstrating the rest of the world that when you let uh, uh, people in, you end up being a superpower. There's a connection there um, that, that people just are really uh, reluctant to embrace and talk about. Instead, they focus instead on the threat of migrants, all these hordes of people headed this way. And um, you know, this is a mistake. And part of this is a timing thing. I mean, Secretary Kerry, I remember going with him to Germany, and he was trying to say, well, you know, this could work well for Germany. You have a demographic problem here. Timing, not the best. You know, they just weren't quite ready to hear that. But it, it is true, and Americans get that. Um, so I think we all have to do more to try to tell the positive story of migration, to, to shine a light on the, um, you know, real energy, you know, people who, who, who are resilient, who take the initiative, who are courageous, who, who really dare to try new things. Um, this is the piece that I think Americans have to speak up about. Unfortunately, US and countries in Europe and elsewhere are really focused in on domestic squabbles, you know, based on sort of misinformation about stealing jobs and you know, scary dark-skinned people headed this way. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just factually screwy. Um, and perhaps you, know, you all, can, can try to get more facts, evidence out there. That's, that's what I am asking you all to do. Maybe one last question here. Uh, uh, thanks, Anne, for these really inspiring uh, remarks. Uh, my question is really a, a nice follow-up to that. Another gap that you mentioned is for IDPs, and what do we do about that $40 million, or 40, 40 million person, person. person gap? Yeah. Um, who are particularly, I think, uh, affected by rule of law um, problems that, that are driving them from their homes. Right. So um, ISIM, the Institute for the Study of International Migration, was started by Susan Martin, um, who for 20 years uh, you know, was a leading voice on internally displaced persons. And now Beth Ferris has, I believe, picked up the torch um, to talk about the needs. And so when when I forget to mention IDPs in my public remarks, I hear this little, in, Beth Ferris looks like an angel sitting on my, on my shoulder who says, Anne, there are you know, nearly twice as many. Um, and so we debate inside our classes, one of my students is here, so she'll be prepared for this on the final exam, <laughs> to discuss who, who, you know, who's worse off, the refugees who have lost their homes or the IDPs who are at home but the international community is not being called upon to help them because their own governments are, have that responsibility. And uh, I know Beth and Susan really feel, don't tell the other students th that this is the answer, that, that the IDPs, because I think you can make an argument either way, Anna, um, but the IDPs are, are worse off because they, they in some ways they're forgotten uh, population. I mean, it's sort of a race to the bottom, right, in many ways, refugees or IDPs. But the IDPs do not have, and this would appeal to this group, I suppose, the international conventions, the treaties, the history, the, 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 an organization standing up for their rights the way refugees do with UNHCR. So thank you for raising it, and I hope you all remind yourselves, you know, listen to your inner Beth Ferris tell you, uh, or, read the, or read the document. This is a very good report. Um, uh, and, and remind yourself about the IDPs. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I know we all thank Anne in giving us this very interesting and thoughtful framing of the issues, giving us some insight into the compacts on refugees 
and migration, giving us a healthy dose of, I guess, what I would call realistic pessimism. But I want to highlight one thing she said at the end of her remarks. She said one of the solutions would be just laws, accountability, and a fair justice system. And of course, that's really what ABA rule of law does day in and day out. And that's where I see some hope on the horizon. So thank you so much. Please join me again in thanking Ann Richard. Uh, now, speaking of migration, you, you are about to. Um, so let me explain the logistics of the breakout sessions. As you know from the program, we've organized things um, focused on the geography of three different regions, Central America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Syria. And within each track, there will have three sessions uh, focused on rule of law, issues in countries of origin, and then rule of law in transit, and finally, destination countries. So in the spirit of migration, you can move among and between these sessions. If you pick Central America first, it doesn't mean you can't go to Syria on the second round. So take a look at the programs. We have fantastic panels. Central America track stays here. Africa will be on the sixth floor in the commons room, and the Syria track will be here on uh, this floor. So as you leave here, there will be uh, those ABA staff and people with badges to tell you where to go. So thanks so much, and please enjoy a very rich day of discussions. The sessions begin at 10. Thank you. Uh, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, okay. 